I'm Wadaresi Tirani, you're watching HuffPost Live. Comedian Noel Fielding is best known for being one half of the quirky British cult comedy, The Mighty Boosh, and now the actor, musician and comedian is bringing his talents to the States in his new stand-up tour, An Evening with Noel Fielding. The comedic artist mixes jokes, live animation, music and some of his former TV characters all into one memorable night, and he joins me now. So, no, welcome to Top Post Live. Hello, how are you? You're good, very well. How are you? What a name. What a name. <laughs> Yours or mine? You both. Both. I Yours, know. really. Yeah, modern well, wrestling, Tirani Fielding. Oh, it's amazing. It's pretty. It's not bad, is it? I like it. So, uh, this is nice. Nice to have you this side of the pond. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Here. So, this is a big deal. Then the first, uh, your first sort of official solo tour in North America. Yeah. How did this all come about then? Mm, it was an accident. <laughs> really? No, I. I guess. <laughs> I've wanted to come to America for a long time. We did nearly come with the bush, but um, we kind of imploded just before we we were going to come out and do a TV show here, actually, and we were going to take America by storm. Yeah. This is what our press people told us. You're right. taking America by storm. It sounded quite frightening and aggressive. We just wanted to sort of ease in like a summer breeze, mm. not really cause much fuss. Just sort of like a, a, no, a, a, you've like got a to take it by storm. <laughs> So you're sort of backing away from that. Yeah, we're pacifists. Mm. We're lovers, not fighters. So we're like we were a bit freaked objectives. out. Yeah, so um, it just was bad timing for us. We never did it. So I'm quite excited to come now. So what is it about America that you think is different when you're performing, like, say, in, in the middle of East London? Well, because of the internet, I think maybe we've got, you know that you've got a lot of fans here, you know? Like, I've got a lot of fans in Russia, which I wouldn't know apart from the internet. So they're like, please come and do a gig. And you just kind of think, all well, for Americans have been asking for a long time. But you kind of have to be known enough that you could actually, you know, sell out venues and actually pay for your airfare. Otherwise, it's impossible, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, you can't... It's, it's quite a big show as well. There's animation in it and sketches and music and other people in it and a crew. And there's lots of stuff in it, props and costumes and... So um, it's quite an expensive show to put on, you know? So you've got to make sure it's not just you and your one American fan. And the, and and the, me and the you. stage manager. Well, yeah, you, you and I are a stage well, manager. Well, I would do it just for you if that, you want. It would be nice. But I'd we like could it. do that here now, couldn't we? Or, you know. I mean, if you want to go, I mean, go for it. I mean, it's just you, you <laughs> me, and everyone who's watching. So where are you from? I'm from, well, I'm from London. Yeah, where are I, really? Yeah. What, you were born in London? I was born in London. I was born in London. Were you? Yeah. yeah. Where? South London. <laughs> You're a Southie. What are you? I'm sort of east and then west. East? Yes. I used to Pair of Vale and Forest Gate, which oh, is sort wow. of weird. Yeah, both of them. How no one else cares. They're like, who gives a shit? They're how like, come you just... ended up here? The happenstance, much oh. in the same way as you. I mean, it's interesting kidnapped, watching you like me. basically kidnapped. Woke yeah, up. And I, was, I woke up 10 minutes ago feeling slightly <laughs> groggy with blood in my pants. Can you really? say that? I'm not you can sure. Say, you can say internet. that. I'm confused. I'm a bit concerned for you with blood in your pants. Really? I'm actually concerned. That was a quite a weird joke to me. I'm a bit jet lagged. I'll blame the jet lag. That's fine. I was thinking you were going to blame the tea now. or something. It's putting the glasses on now. This I is what we know. I did not that... say that I have blood in my pants. Okay. That didn't happen. Okay. This is no one who's got his glasses happen. on. That's the yeah, blue tinted glasses. <laughs> uh, tell, me, tell me though about, you know, you said that you were about to come to America and then the boosh kind of imploded and... It was, you know, it's interesting because that was, it was a while ago when, you know, that was all going it's down. It's neat vodka. Uh, it is neat vodka, especially for you. Um, so that was all, it was a while ago when that all went down. And yeah, then, it was ages ago. It was like in but the people, 70s. But I think people still associate now. you so much with, with that because the show is just so unique in so many ways. Does that make you, yes. is that like okay? You sort of, does that sit well with you that people sort of associate you so much with that period? I've kind of accepted it now. Mm. It's quite tricky because I'm not probably the person I was when I was in that show. I was quite young and sort of like a Camden buffoon, you know. Uh, I used to wear sort of glitter ball cat suits and stuff. So I was quite um, a different character, a little bit of a different character. Um, I'm a bit older and a bit wiser, not so thin. <laughs> <laughs> But I was can, quite naive then, and I think I'm a little bit more jaded now. Were you naive about what, the, the industry or just, just life in general? Or? I just was having a good time, you know. As Julian said, you'd be happy in a show. I was just quite, you know, he said to me, you see a peanut, the day's off to a good start for you. That's all you need. <laughs> and was, he was probably right, whereas now I've got, I've got needs, I need more. Peanut M&Ms? Yeah, Not I need a, a sugary coating on my peanuts now. <laughs> Rose tinted glasses yeah. and a sugary coating. Makes I am sense. hurtling towards diabetes as we speak. <laughs> You're in the right country. I love sugar. I'm like a wasp. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's okay. I'm I really bothered about cheese. I mean, people go on about cheese and I'm like, ah. As get... you get older, I suppose you're supposed to develop that side of the palate. I know, you? but I never did. I just like to inject hardcore sugar directly into my eyeballs. The eyeball? Yeah. 
That seems a little extreme. It does seem a little extreme. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. I don't that. know, I'm not, I just thought it was for dramatic effect. <laughs> I'm not sure, I, was like, I thought there were syringes or something. Do you like this coat? Um, I sort of feel a bit like a sort of Sesame Street character today. I mean, it is Sesame Street chic though. Yeah, it is, yeah. If you add chic Who's to anything. Who's the guy in Sesame Street with the red hair? Elmo? Elmo, that's him. Mm. He wasn't really my generation. It's more Oscar. They're coming back though. I mean, Sesame Street is, you know, this is great what timing do you mean for you. They're coming back. Well, they're not real. They're puppets. No, no, they're coming back. Well, they're just getting up out of the puppet box. Don't spoil it, no. Down the street. <laughs> <laughs> they are coming back. Hey, we're coming back. We've had enough of this shit. <laughs> we're coming for you. That's not happening. No, it really is. Honestly, <laughs> HBO gave them this? a lot of money and they're going to HBO now. Really? It was PBS. It was all what? Money. HBO gave the puppets a lot of money Tons and of went, money. hey, come on. Tons of money. Just get up. Elmo is now like sat in lined. Can afford satin. Oh, I did love the Muppets in Sesame Street. I love Jim Henson. He's a very, I mean, in terms of creative minds, I yeah. would imagine that he, Tim Burton, those people Labyrinth. probably. Yeah, Dark Crystal. I was mm. obsessed with Dark Crystal, yeah. We mentioned Labyrinth. I mean, that was, I know that David Bowie, obviously, terribly oh. sad of, about his passing. It's killed me, yeah. That was a, t that's, it was a tough, tough piece of news to wake oh, up to. How yeah. much of an influence would you say that he had on? Not just you, well, just, yeah, not just on the bush, but like you as a Everything, performer. Yeah, a lot, 80%. A really? Lot. Yeah. Um, uh, glam rock in general. My mum sort of grew up on, my mum, when I grew up, my mum was listening to Mark Bolan and David Bowie and stuff like that. So I grew up thinking it was okay to wear lycra and glitter. It's nice. It was fine for boys to wear makeup. You know, he's a real gender bender. And I think Vince and the bush was kind of obsessed with. Bowie and Julian was obsessed with jazz. Mm. That was the way it went. And I used to say, it's all about, it's all about David Bowie. There's, he, that's the first music. It was just tuning up until that point. <laughs> Julian go, what about jazz? And I go, whoa, oh, jazz. <laughs> that's for mentally ill people. <laughs> That's for supply teachers and the mentally ill. But Bowie was, I mean, you know, he was, it seemed like he was very he, much a kind of creative, not just a touchstone for you, but yeah. really did embody a lot of things that, that you appreciate about art. In that He's sense. in my, yeah, absolutely. I love him. I love his aesthetic and I love his poetic nature and his look and his lyrics and his melodies, everything about him, really. I love the fact that he just changed and didn't care what anyone said. They were like, please do Ziggy Stardust again. He's like, no, nah, I'm not interested. Just kept changing. I love that wriggling about like a genre spanner. <laughs> Do you, well, I mean, that's interesting that you mentioned that, the, the, the notion of the taxonomy, right? People like yeah. to, to box you and label you. Yes. You are that person, now keep doing that. Yeah. Do you feel that for you as well, like people sort of say, that. oh no, you know, you're, you're Vince, do that, do I that. I think maybe that's why I've come here. There's less boxing in. Mm. Well, they don't care enough because they don't really, there's like a small cult here. We were on Adult Swim, so it's not such a big deal. Whereas in, in Britain, I think maybe the bush kind of touched people in quite a, in a perverse, strong way. So people uh, very much associate me with the character of Vince. And so when I try to do different stuff, they're like, no, you've, no, get back and do the boosh. <laughs> but it's fascinating because you've done so much, you know, since. I know. But I think maybe here people don't care so much. So maybe I'll have a bit of freedom here that I didn't have. Do you in think that that is kind of categorised for a lot of British comedy? I mean, I've been away for a while, so it's sort of, you know, you hear from friends about the, the, the landscape kind of shifting and things yeah. becoming a little bit more maybe stale. Do you think that it has gone that way in terms of British comedy or just I think maybe television in general because of the internet. Um, maybe now there's so much choice on the internet and it's easy and young kids, that's how they want to do it, you know? They don't want to be told when to watch something or how long a programme should be, you know? They just sort of surf around the internet and go, oh, this thing's two minutes long. It's still good, you know? So maybe now television is just a place for sort of reality TV, which is the opposite to what I do. You know, we make scripts and um, costumes and sets and make-believe worlds and reality TV is sort of, for us, is like the Antichrist, you know? Just people in a storage unit and then, you know, some quite boring reality TV, which I don't hate all reality TV, but there's some boring reality TV. Do you TV. watch any reality TV? Yeah, I like Project Runway. Do you, do you really? <laughs> I it, I'm it well. slightly obsessed with Tim Gunn. He, we, I interviewed Tim Gunn, him if on you're this... watching this, would you want to meet up tomorrow for coffee? I bet you know where there's good coffee. I've said, he's in the, the neighbourhood. He, he? He, he sat exactly where you were sat now. Oh, I'm and sitting where Tim chat. Gunn sat. Yes. I love Tim. If you're watching Tim, please take me out tomorrow for coffee. We should, we'll, um, we'll tweet, connect you or something. We'll make yeah. this happen. Post but I love the Project Runway because they're making something. Do you know what I mean? It's like um, 
it's sort of quite, it's dynamic because they're sort of, you're getting to see the creative process. You know, there's a pottery show in England at the moment, great pottery throwdown, which is again, they're making pots and something, you're learning something while you're watching it. But the shows where it's just, you know, in a pawn shop and it's some guy going, I just got this shelf for $2, I can get 10 for this. Is like, what? I'm, I might have to blow my own head off if I watch <laughs> this. Well, thing. especially you said the, about the, the pottery. I haven't seen the pottery one, I confess, but I have been very recently watching the, the Great British Bake Off. Well, they call yes. it, we call it here over here the Great British Baking Show. Why do you have to change everything? I don't know. Well, you're just, that's disloyal. <laughs> we invented that show. Well, it was not, not actually me per se. I mean, it's, you know, the Can you have a word, though? You've network. got connections. <laughs> totally. You love reality TV <laughs> here. I mean, look at Donald Trump. What's going on there? He's what? from The Apprentice. The now view? he's going to be president. So the view from... What is happening there? Hello, what's happening? Is this a dream? Am I ever going to wake up from this? Worse or better, though, than George W. Bush? Oh. Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's such a difficult question. I mean, and I'd say worse, probably. Why? Well, where do we get started? You can start wherever you want, love. I mean, you know, oh, the stuff that he said about immigrants in general, you know, I mean, it's not good, is it? I don't know, he's sort of insane, saying stuff like, we just need to turn the internet off, let's get in touch with Bill Gates. And you go, what, he owns the internet, does <laughs> he? has got a switch in his house, <laughs> right, we've turned it off. No! <laughs> I mean, what's happening? It's just insane, isn't it? But is it, is it what, is, really that crazy over here? Are we going to have to now have Gordon Ramsay as Prime Minister in England? Is that, what's, is that where we're headed? Similar hair, maybe. I mean, I you know. watch Obama and you just go, he's got charm and intelligence. And then, you know, I was watching him do his last speech last night. And then I flicked over him. Uh, the Trump man was there. And I just thought, well, the, you, the contrast is startling. But the scary thing for me, and then this again, you know, I've not I, been I home in a while, no, but... I don't know. But, the, the, you know, what Donald Trump has been saying, the immigrant and that sort of thing, that rhetoric, not necessarily in the same kind of exact terms, but I've seen it in the, you know, the way that David Cameron will say some things and, you know... Really? The xenophobic... What, you've seen a bit of Trump in Cameron? Elements of the sort of... A bit of Trump in Cameron. slightly xenophobic... <laughs> well, I don't even want to think about that. Uh, but, you know, you know how, how yeah. do you see things when you're able to, you know, do you feel like it ha the landscape is kind of shifting? I don't understand any of it. I mean, what are we... Who, who is just, you know, one... Doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I'm half Irish, half French. You know, who is what? What are we talking about? Nobody is just one sort of pure race. It's like weird. It's like it doesn't even make any sense, does it? We're so multicultural. The world is just a mixture, and that's what's beautiful about it. But I feel like you I understand have been... the idea that you would go right. We have to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> These people are from over there. <laughs> if they come over here, whoa, it's all gonna it's gonna be bad. But I feel like you've been raised. You, you know, your your parents obviously were very sort of, <laughs> your parents, your words, not mine. But, you know, I think that they were, they seem to have kind of raised you in a very sort of, I guess, like free environment, maybe, yeah. is, is sort of how you've described it yes. before. a hippie commune is what you're trying to get <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it just sounds like, you know, you were a surrounded by creative people and you, you were able to, like, listen to kind of cool music and inspiration. Yeah. And I was lucky. My mum and dad were very young. I think that's the key. My, mom, my dad was, like, 19 or something when he had me, 18, maybe. So, you know, they were very tolerant and a lot of their crazy friends were around all the time. So, and they listened to Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart and... You know, so I was very lucky in that way. So, um, probably a bit loose in a way. I mean, nowadays, I'd probably get taken into care. No, <laughs> no I'm joking. No. But, but they had a lot but, of parties and, you know, they, I could sort of cook when I wanted to and go to bed when I wanted to. And they were quite easy, you know, it was sort of a different time then. Was there any sense when you were obviously, you know, you were being yourself, and was there any sense at any point when you were younger in when your teenage years? When I was being years, myself. When you were being yourself. <laughs> a bit when I was younger, where, I wasn't being myself. Well, no, but where it I was, was difficult Liza to Manelli. be. It was difficult to be yourself. <laughs> um, you know, like where people were sort of, you know, people, especially young kids, when everyone likes to be uniform, right? Especially yeah, at school. At oh, school. you've got to look the same and dress the same. At and that high kind of school, thing. I was quite skinny, and I don't think uh, maybe that was quite good to be a bit muscly and sort of straight, you know? sort of gelled short hair, and I was never really that. Um, when I was a teenager, it was a bit difficult. I used to go to clubs, and I wasn't really into what they were playing. It was like dance music, and it's quite sort of weird, chavvy clubs, you know, and I was into, I suppose I was into kind of psychedelic music, and, you know, the Beatles and stuff. I wasn't really into music of the time, or dressing 
in the way that a lot of people dressed. It is quite tricky, but then I went to art school and everyone was a freak. So then, you know, when I came out of art school, I had to, you've sort of got to try and assimilate back into society because <laughs> it's like being, you know, in Moss Eisley from Star Wars. It's not really normal. <laughs> and you come out in your makeup and your silver suit and your pink cowboy hat. And, and you're wearing platform like, shoes. Like, why, why is yeah. no one else doing this? Yeah, exactly. And people are like, oh, my God, what is you? <laughs> you're like, yeah, I think I've gone a bit far. But then, you, you know, you're the last person to laugh, aren't you? Because you, you're the one who's, you know, got the creative success from it. You well, know, it was quite good huge. was the boost because I think a lot of kids were influenced by Vince because he wore makeup and wore girls' clothes and didn't seemingly, he wasn't seemingly one gender or the other. I mean, obviously he was a boy, but he was quite a, a bit of a girl boy and he used to talk about that. He used to call myself the confuser. Oh, it's a boy, it's a girl. I'm, oh, is it? I'm not sure I mind. <laughs> so I guess, you know, my heroes are all like that, you know? So I think we should all be free. Do you think that we're at a place now where, because of shows like The Booch, that actually yeah. people are a little bit more tolerant of anybody that says, hey, you know what, I don't want to identify in one box or another or any of the boxes that you present to me? I hope so. I hope so. I hope some of that freedom did kind of uh, spread to the youth. Lots of kids liked our show, you see, and I was quite proud of that. I love kid, you know, kids watching it because I think... They're quite open, aren't they, to stuff? They're not so judgmental about weirdness or surrealism or gender bending or any of those things. They're quite, you know, they're quite into it. So I think Julian brought a lot of stuff to it in his own way as well. Lots of weird avant-garde How dads. close are you both still? I think people are so obsessed with that. You know, you, do you guys hang out? We're you still text? lovers. We're yeah, lovers. basically. He lives opposite me and he can see into my bedroom and I can see into his front room so he's got the best deal he's got a better view i guess bad view actually because he's just me in my pants pretending to be mick jagger every morning that's how i, <laughs> that's how I get ready for my days <laughs> it's a nice wake up call though gives me the confidence to just go out and tackle life <laughs> you'll start me up on and you start getting getting your getting your kecks on my little pants <laughs> it's lovely i mean every, we should all we should all be so you know what's what how I'm do you for? start your days usually looking at my phone at the news Really? Yeah, it's depressing. Not in your pants, dancing to Mick Jagger. Not in my pants. I should do. I know. It would make the news a little bit more, like, well, less depressing, I suppose. It, it was a bit depressing this week, I have to say. Was it? Yeah, it was a bit depressing. Why? What sort of stuff? They were just, well, Bowie, that was a hard Monday morning. Because it was it, later on in the day for you all, I guess, in, in the UK, but it was morning for us. Well, I so came depressing. here, which was so, this is the weirdest thing. I came here and my friend Dolly Wells, who's in Dolan mm. she I stayed with her and her family. And, uh, Weirdly enough, she's doing some show called Blunt Talk and um, the director or the writer had shown her a clip of something he wanted her to do in the show, like a dance piece, and it was to a Bowie song and she'd just fallen in love with this Bowie song. And she said, oh, have you heard this? And she put it on. I said, yeah, I really like that album. It's off London Boy. You know, the old really 60s stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so we were listening to Bowie literally one o'clock in the morning and then I woke up the next morning and I had like 100 texts on my phone going, oh my God, Bowie's dead. And I was like, is this a joke? Yeah. I was devastated. It, it's interesting. What do you think about Did the way cry? that? Did you cry? I cried. It was yeah. It was very moving. A few times. Well, I because it's it's so ingrained. I think people. It was difficult. I don't know. It's difficult to sort of express. Really, it's the kind of thing that you know. I grew up and my mum would put the laughing gnome on. Yeah. So it's such a different type of iteration yeah. of Bowie. You know, we're sort of talking Decca records or whatever one it was, and it's sort of someone that you don't ever realise is permeating through. Yeah. The way you experience the world and the way yeah. you experience music and the way you experience, like you say, gender, culture, all those yeah. different things. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is, it is sad. It's very funny as well, apparently. He was really hilarious. Brian Eno kept saying that they'd have, like, you know, email conversations and he was really hilarious. Did you ever meet him? Did you ever get the chance? Well, you know what? I did a photo shoot where I had to dress up as him so I sort of didn't eat for two weeks because I was like, oh, my God, I've got to wear this outfit. Don't try that He's at home, kids. So by the way. Thin, Don't try David that at home. Bowie. He's so thin. It's not even possible, you know, to get as thin as Bowie. But I was quite thin at the time and I was, I, I had to wear the same makeup and all this stuff. Um, he saw it, it was in the Times Culture or something, or the Observer magazine, I can't remember. And anyway, he saw it and put it on his Facebook page and then sent me an email saying oh, it was great. And I was like, wow. But I never got to meet him in person. What did you say back to that though? Do you reply to the email? Yeah, just like, you know, He's one of the big ones, you know. It's like when Kate Bush got in touch with me, I was like, oh, 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 oh. now that was that's pretty amazing. Now we're friends. There's this. Exp so you really are you actually friends with Kate Bush? Yeah. Could you right, text her? Yeah. Like could, you could text her right now and say, Kate, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. That would be quite. I'm quite excited now. 
Could you just oh, be like, what are you? a big Kate Bush I love fan. Kate Bush. I used to have a radio show with a friend of mine. Kate we would Bush play is... a Kate Bush record every week. She's kind of like the female Bowie in a way. She's kind of very conceptual and artistic and into dance. They both had dance lessons from Lindsay Kemp, didn't they? And she's into mime and ballet and all those things that Bowie brought to the table. They would I imagine they were friends. I, well, I don't know that actually, but I'm imagining it would be I a shame. I hope so. It'd be a strange were. universe if they weren't. You, this is a fascinating thing because you did for charity for you know Comic Relief in the UK, a big charity did come over here as well. You became, you embodied Kate Bush uh, in, in <laughs> Wuthering Heights, and uh, here there we go. There you are. Wonderful. <laughs> Tell me, how did you get prepare? And how did you prepare for this role? Because I think this is one of your best. Oh wow. Um, well, I. When I thought about doing it, it was actually my girlfriend whose idea it was. Because they say come up with a song that you want to interpret in the dance, but you have to do it properly. You know, you can't just um, do it all for comedy value. So I want, and because I love Kate Bush, I didn't want to do it in a jokey way. So I really wanted to learn how to do the dance. And um, I don't know that much about dancing, but then because I had a really brilliant teacher called Iggy who taught me and it was all about the weight of your body and like the pendulum and how you sort of distribute your weight and it's all this kind of crazy stuff that because it is just basically visually interpreting something mm. an emotion but with your body with the movements of your body and obviously everyone knows that but when you're dancing sometimes that's you're not aware of that right know? right right because usually when you're dancing it's more free you know, free form. You're not necessarily thinking about You're it. You're just that in way. your pants pretending to be Mick Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you danced? When did I last dance? Probably last night, actually. I danced a lot on my own in yeah. the kitchen. Do you? Where were you last night? What, at a club? Just at home. No, just at home. Just at home I, I think I danced when I arrived home. Really? My husband dances a lot. So you dance together? Well, yes, Separately. we do. No, we to do. make each other laugh. Yeah, this morning, as I, we have an elevator in our building, and so you sort of, I say bye. And he was doing a little shimmy. He'll hate yeah. me saying this. Sorry. He was doing like a little shimmy as I was going down the <laughs> elevator. And it, it's nice, that, but it's nice because I think that you, it's, it's love shimmy. and laughter, isn't it? You know, he's a very, he has a very good shimmy. He has got a good shimmy. Yeah. And then you came to work, and I went round his house, and we danced together. And you I like this there. idea, though. I like that. I mean, I don't like the fact that I wasn't there, but it's nice that the dancing continued when I left. I filmed it on my phone. Did you? Yeah. Did you text it to Kate Bush? I did. What did Kate say? She was nonplussed. What? Bloody hell! <laughs> She's got to give you a good grade. I have to ask you, how did you manage to get the hand, the Wuthering hands down? Well, you know what? That is challenging to do that sort of Marcel Marceau. I nailed it on one take on the semi-final, and on the final I didn't quite nail it. Um, Hang on a second. We can see it though the in final. a second. It'll, be, it'll come at us. Look, look. It doesn't... There it is. There it is. It doesn't look that great, but it sort of took a long time just to learn that one dance. And then you realise how good she is. She's as good as, you know, a proper ballet dancer. And yet she's, you know, a singer. And the teacher was saying she's, what she's doing is, is brilliant. She mm -hmm. could have been a dancer, you know. Well, and then you were in one of her music videos. Yeah. Which is, With that Bobby must Coltrane. have been. That, which was, it's a really well done, it. kind of creepy, really yeah. sort of, I don't know, dystopic almost, yeah. the, the, the whole video. But that's what's amazing about her. She sort of met me for it, there I am in that video, met me f through doing that and just went, why don't you be in my video, you know? And I was like, that's what I love, you know, like when you meet someone and you have something common with someone and they just, because I'm like that, if I meet someone and they inspire me in any way, I want to work with them, you know? She, is it right to say that she doesn't have airs and graces? She's amazing. She's funny and clever and creative. I went and see her live show in Hammersmith. Did you go? I didn't. It was, it was just unfortunate. Phenomenal. It. Yeah. yeah. There were several of them, weren't there? Like two or three of them, I think. Yeah, and did, it was phenomenal. It was amazing. She's a, she's a genius. Is there anyone else like her at the moment? Not necessarily like her. I, I don't. I don't want to say the next seen Kate Bush, but Lady is there anyone Gaga. inspiring you in that way, in I've, the way that she would or Bowie would? Yeah, but not in the same, maybe in the same way. I've not seen Gaga live. I don't know what she does live, but and she does Her a voice is fantastic. Visual live. element. It's not kind of my music, that's the problem. Mm. It has to be your music, doesn't it? First and foremost, and that, that's not kind of my thing. What is your uh, thing at the moment then? What's sort of on your, you know, on your iPod or... Mm, what am I listening to? On your to? iPhone, whatever you listen to. On your vinyl player. I can never remember when people ask me what really? I'm listening to. You've got to have something at hand, you know. I know. I often just delve deep into the vaults and get into stuff that I wasn't into. I'm having a bit of a Beatles phase at the moment because I wasn't ever really into the Beatles, I was into the Stones. I grew up on the Stones, so I'm having a bit of a weird 
Beatles. So do you um, shimmy? Do you just sort of oscillate between Jagger in the morning and then sometimes you'll do a John Lennon in the Lennon. evening? Yeah. George Harrison at tea time. <laughs> nice, it brings you down. I've met Macca. Have you really? What do you think of Macca? I love Macca. He's amazing. I saw him on a bus in Soho. I actually, we opened. He rides the bus. Yeah, because he's so famous, no one really bothers him, you know, because they just go, oh, my God, it's Paul McCartney. And he's so famous, like seeing the Queen, like people don't go, oh, can I get a selfie? They just sort of evaporate like a vitamin C tablet. <laughs> they just dissolve like a Barocca. <laughs> I was going to say, like a Barocca into a glass. Yeah, they don't really wow. bug people like that because they're so Do people do, famous. do people bug you? Then? Yeah, do they, they constantly do. Ask so I'm not famous enough, so I'm sort of like approachable and... Oh my God, it's that guy. You know, a lot of people go, can I get a photo? Because you're famous. And I go, you don't even know who I am. And they're like, yeah, but you're famous. It's like some weird wheel of madness. Do you ask them to clarify? Do you sort of say, name the last no, three things I was in? They don't know. They go, I don't know who you are, but like my mate says you're famous. I'm doing a bit of a London chav voice there. That's a bit wrong. Say, everyone. I used to be a chav, it's fine. You're owning that lifestyle. This is before to be art school. I a bit of a chav, yeah. I had to hand in my chav notice when I went to art school. I don't think they let you. It's a sad day for me. <laughs> Very sad. Um, my chavs beat me up. I have a question. This is just about comedy, as this is what you're, you know, you're right and you're brilliant and you, you know all this stuff. Ricky Gervais, he obviously, he hosted the Golden Globes. <laughs> I and saw a bit of it. What did you think? Well, so what did you think of him first? Do you think he was any good? Do you think it was a good run? <laughs> what? The Golden Globes? Yeah, what he did. Did you think he was good? I did. I liked it. I couldn't help liking it because it's so English, you know, it's sort of that thing where... People are so rude. He was so rude, it was shocking. <laughs> like when he sort of left that beer on the table when Mel Gibson came on and took it away, I was like, wow. And there was one bit where he called the audience filth. He went, you're filth. And then when he went, shut up. <laughs> and at that point, they showed a clip and he went, oh, kill me. <laughs> like he hated it. I liked how honest it was. I thought it was really funny. He did really make me laugh. So the backlash here has been, you know, predictably. Has it been bad? Yes. People have sort of been saying, well, it was kind of mixed mostly on the bad side, though. So he's been tweeting, he says, you've every right to be offended. Just don't cry when no one cares. And then another one more recently where he said, so person A, I'm offended by what you said, person B. I'm offended that you told me that, person A. I don't care. I can say what I want, person B. There you go. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to necessarily be something that a lot of people, a lot of audiences hold true anymore. Do you think it's become more difficult for you to be outrageous? Yes. I don't know. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, I made a... Sometimes I do a TV show and I make a joke and it's in bad taste and it's shocking, but that's how humour works, you know? So they're not going to use it. And yeah, it's the joke in the room that gets the biggest laugh. So you sort of say, well, who are we kidding here? Who are we protecting? Like I, you know, made a joke about saying that Butterfly, um, that moths, I was talking about moths, moths, I can't speak, talking about moths, and I said they were like butterflies with AIDS. And basically, you can't really say that, but everyone laughed at it, and you sort of go, well, why is everyone laughing? It's sort of like, because jokes are jokes, they're not supposed to be real, they're not supposed to be taken in a, you know, it's a, just a stupid joke, really, you know. It's sort of... Um, it's very difficult because then I suppose if it's offensive to some people, it's like, can you make a joke about cancer? Can you make a joke about uh, a blind person? Can you make a joke about uh, race? It's very tricky to know where the lines are. And they, they seem to oscillate and move around all the time. Like with Gervais, obviously he's been put in that situation where he's there to undermine all those very famous people and that's kind of what's funny about it. Because, that's why they book him, isn't it? Well, especially in America, you don't see, celebrities culture is so powerful that you don't see those people being talked to in that way. I mean, you saw Mel Gibson getting a bit annoyed and saying, I'm gonna put you to sleep in a different way. And it's like, but that didn't make Mel Gibson seem any better, it made him seem worse. So it's like, if he'd just not said anything, you might have felt a little bit sorry for him. Like, well, that was a bit unnecessary. Obviously, he was going for a bad time when all that stuff happened, and it's, you know, he's having to face it now. But um, him sort of going, yeah, I'll put you to sleep, sort of makes you go, wow, you don't really, there's something quite weird. You can't win when you're that high status, I don't think. So it's quite good to have someone, it's like a jester, wasn't it? Like in a kingdom, just pricking the sort of pomposity of mm. people who are very high. So, status. sort of Gervais, kind of, you know, in that sense, because he has. Got I to loved the point. it. I thought it was great. I Is just, there anything that, when you're performing, that you've actually had to say to yourself, I'm I can't really say that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not really an offensive comedian, you know. So I don't have to run into this 
I don't run into this trouble that much. I mean, my stuff's quite surreal and quite charming, but I do quite like occasionally to throw in something a bit shocking, you know? But I don't, I think it's the intent, isn't it? If you really, they can, people can tell if you're, if you say something about, if they can see whether you mean it, whether you care, whether it's coming from a dark place or if you're just being a silly and saying something shocking to get a reaction. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think he actually, a lot of those things were just him trying to get a reaction. You know? How, yeah, but having to get a rise out of people, worst things that basically. you do with your friends. I mean, everyone knows that. You just say really wrong things and everyone laughs. And you know you can't particularly say those things in real life. But then that's the kind of, that's the sort of stimulating part of comedy, isn't it? Is that you can just say something really wrong. It doesn't mean that it necessarily, that you're, that you, you're an evil person. So you necessarily just, believe those things? No, you're just saying stuff for shock value or something. So what are you most excited about in this upcoming tour? And <laughs> are you going to be knocking on Hollywood's door? Because I read this as well. You were saying that, you know... I don't know you, where it is. Mike, well, well, you said Mike Myers. Wasn't he going to write you a film? And then you said, he you just sort of said no. A, no, he had an idea to write a film with us. It was a good idea, actually. Um, he liked the bush and he had an idea of a film that he could be in and we could be in, but... As I say, it was a point in, an, in time where we were kind of dissolving like a Baraka, so we weren't really ready for that. Um, it was quite overwhelming. Jack Black wanted to do something, and Robin Williams came to our gig, and all these people that were our heroes were coming and liked our show, and we were just made this weird little quirky show in England, you know? So we weren't really ready for that, and also it was at a point where it was the wrong timing, so... But yeah, it would have been fun to have done something collaborate with someone as good as that, you know? But, I mean, yes, surely the ship has not, like, just sailed. I mean, you know, if you were to be oh, in L.A., has it? a long time ago. Could you not be in it's L.A.? It's like the owl just... and the pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit like the owl but and could the pussycat. But could you not just phone, you know, phone Mike Myers and say, hey, man, you know, remember me? <laughs> I don't I'm in L.A. That. He'd be like, who is this? <laughs> he's got an Canadian accent, which neither of us can do. Um, go, hey, yeah, he hasn't really got a Canadian accent, has he? We're sort of He'd lost probably it a just little, text back, really. this ship has sailed, mate. It's dissolved like a Barocca. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an egg timer when you get an idea. Like, Go, let's do it. No? Right, you're out. Next. So what are you most excited <laughs> about now? in the I'm next... 75 now. <laughs> oh, 75. It's ridiculous. I'd love to do some stuff in America. I, like, I, feel, I kind of feel like we got to the top of the tree in, in England, you know, and it was nice and it was fun. And America's like a whole new place and there's more stuff going on because it's a bigger country and there's some really interesting stuff going on like Adult Swim, I Love, and Tim and Eric and, you know, all of there's loads of great stuff going on in America and lots of opportunities and um, you know American people are cool and they get stuff and the fact that Gervais is doing that shows you that it's possible everything is possible everything's possible everything Kate Bush though it's all about Kate Bush it's all about Kate Bush I, we're gonna David Bowie. We just just oh David Bowie yeah and dancing in your pants in the morning to Mick Jagger and ending yeah. it with Lennon and Ringo yeah. and you didn't mention Ringo did you though George. I love Ringo. Everyone lo should love Ringo. He's going to be the last one left. I feel like with comedy, you should be able to say everything as long as it's not coming from a horrible place. You should just be able to make jokes. But obviously, if people are offended, you have to be a bit careful. We should all love each other and lick each other's eyes. <laughs> On that note, we're going to end it licking eyes. <laughs> we started with eyes. Sort of, we and we're ending with eyes. eyes. They're the um, windows to the soul. <laughs> this is just neat vodka. It's just what is that? Pure vodka. No, such I can a pleasure. taste my hypno in it. <laughs> <laughs> You cannot, not true, not true. You I can't like taste the it, taste apparently. of my hypno. You don't like That's it, you don't, can't taste anything. I love it. Are you allowed to joke about that? I don't, I mean, and now I I'm in, we're in a grey area. We're in a grey area. Is we this are live? in a grey area. It's actually live. Oh, no. Yeah, Why didn't realize. you tell me? I know. So they thought it was half post recorded. Uh, no, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming that in. The, that was the uh, most powerful interview I've ever done. Thank you. I love you a little it bit. Was the, really? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I do too. I feel like we go back to England? Sometimes. Not much anymore. It's hard, isn't it? It's expensive to get back. You live here now? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Okay, yeah. I don't have Kate Bush on my phone though. So it's always one up on me, no fielding. No one has Kate Bush on her phone, on their phone. You Kate Bush is just Oh, she's, yeah, she's omnipresent. everywhere. Omnipresent, yeah. Omnipresent. She, yeah, if you want to get in contact with Kate Bush, you have to go into the, you know, into na back to nature, under the moon, in a... In my pants. Silhouetted forest. Yeah, and just sort of, just think for a while. And if your thoughts are pure, she'll appear to you.
in the form of... Oh, I don't know. My thoughts are never that pure. She never went <laughs> uh, Noel Fielding's door. You guys, you've got to check got out his website. <laughs> <laughs> Noelfielding.co.uk. You can check it out. It's got the full listings of all of his upcoming tour dates. Be sure to see him. Very funny guy. And he might give you Kate Bush's cell phone number. Stick around. More <laughs> I don't have it. I haven't got it. <laughs> Coming up next.